This is the Bring Back Soul Music Podcast, the only podcast devoted to making soul music relevant again. Let's get started with your host, Todd Woodson. Thank you for joining me for another episode of the Bring Back Soul Music Podcast. My special, special, special guest today is a talented singer-songwriter out of Brooklyn, New York. She goes by the name of Shola. Hey, Shola, how you doing today? I'm fantastic. Thank you for uh, joining the show today. I must apologize. We've been kind of, I didn't realize that we have been emailing each other, um, I guess it's almost like two months. I didn't realize it had been that long. Um, yeah, we just, yeah, we kept missing each other, but I'm, I'm very happy that you're on the show today. I really appreciate it. Um, and we're going to get into all your music. Now we featured um, one of your songs lately on mm -hmm. our um, new music section on our podcast at bringbacksoulmusic.com for January wow. and February. And you just released a new single called Feel Immortalized, right? Yeah. Okay. Nineteenth. Okay, great. And uh, you have some great music. But um, before we get into all that, we will. Um, for those who don't know Shola, um, go ahead and uh, tell us about yourself. So I am Shola. <laughs> Shola Di Ferrara is my government name, but also my artist name. I was born in Oakland, California. Uh, so that's where I'm from, that's where I read. And um, let's see, I really started my music career in Paris, France, where I lived for eight years, uh, beginning in 2011. Um, and I released a jazz album in 2016 uh, with the quintet, the Florian Polisi quintet. Um, then, it's been almost two years that I moved back to New York because I went to college here in New York. Um, I studied music at Fordham University. And so I've just been here continuing um, my artist journey, just releasing music, creating music, finding different people to collaborate with. And basically my musical background, my mom is Jamaican and I, so I'm Jamaican and I spent a lot of time in Jamaica. As I said, I lived in, in France for eight years and through music, travel to a lot of African countries. And so I have a lot of different musical influences in my head and in just my repertoire. And so um, bringing them all together to create new music that I enjoy and that hopefully people who like my voice and my style enjoy too. Okay. Um, now I read your, uh, your profile. Um, you are the daughter of a professor and a writer. Mm -hmm. Is that, yeah. um, does that, well, obviously being, being a, a child of a writer, did that obviously have some influence on you and in, in writing music? Um, yeah, my mom is a writer and a professor and my father is a professor too and creative. So uh, I definitely have that in my background. Uh, my mom wrote, writes poetry and short stories. So it's definitely very different from writing music. Um, so I'm not sure how much it helped me writing music because it's a different genre, you know, um, but feeling comfortable writing and more importantly, feeling comfortable to express myself in a creative way was really nurtured in my upbringing. So that's a big part of who I am and the experience that I had. A lot of people ask me, you know, was your family, is your family supportive? And I'm like, yeah, like my, my whole family is creative. No one is in music. Um, the way that I am, but just the importance of art and expression in that way and pursuing your dreams is something that I was really blessed and fortunate to, an environment that I was fortunate enough to be raised in. Okay. Now, um, you mentioned that your parents or your family um, aren't into music, I guess, professionally per se. Yeah. How did you get the um, the music bug? That's a great question. I mean, I loved music. There was always music in my house. Um, whether it was reggae and jazz. And I went to concerts really early on. Like my parents took me 
to um, jazz concerts. There's a club called the Kim, well, it doesn't exist anymore, but it was called the Kimble Kimball's East in um, Emeryville, which is close to Oakland. And I would go to concerts there a lot. And I loved listening to singers and just experiencing music. And anyway, Oakland, California, in addition to be like politically the history that we have with like Black Panthers and things like that, it's a very culturally rich place. And so music and the arts were a big part of things. And um, actually when I was younger, I had the same voice that I do now, my speaking voice, but maybe it was a little bit more raspy. So a lot of times people would be like, you must be a singer with that voice, you know? And so I kind of was like, okay. And so then I, I, I really started to enjoy singing because I would just sing along to people that I, like I loved Patti LaBelle. Um, I also loved Mariah Carey. So I'm like singing at the top of my lungs in my bedroom doing it. And then I kind of had these encouraging, you know, like people encouraging me who didn't know me just because of the quality of my, my speaking voice. And so then I started to, um, you know, slowly but surely take lessons and sing in the choir and just build a little bit more confidence around it. Okay. Um, I don't think I mentioned it to you before we were talking offline, but when you remember when you mentioned uh, Kimball's East, I know that very well because I'm actually from the Bay Area too. Um, oh, I'm, from, yeah, I'm from Vallejo. And okay. um, yeah, so I've seen many concerts at Kimball's East as well. Okay. Um, so let me ask you a quick question though. Um, because you're from the Bay Area and you mentioned that not just Oakland, but um, the entire Bay Area is pretty diverse musically. Mm -hmm. um, is that reflective, even though you're based in, uh, on the East coast now, and I believe I read that you, you know, you spend half your time or since spend some time, excuse me, over in Paris as well. Mm -hmm. But do you take a little Bay area flavor to you? Is that reflective in your music? That is a good question. And no one has ever asked me that. I don't, I can't say that I do. Like I, when I was growing up, I mean, it was like between, like, I was listening to people like Too Short and um, The Loonies. And then like, right as I was kind of leaving, it was like the hyphy mo movement. So, and, and if we're talking about like vocalists, the only vocalist that I really knew from Oakland or the Bay was Guapale. Um, so I, I can't say that my music has any of that kind of flavor because it was more rap music that I think I, I was listening to that was from the Bay than like singing um, or that kind of musical style in that way. So I can't say that the, I have some Bay influences in my music actually, but when I hear Bay music, I mean, I get down. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, now you mentioned that uh, you went to uh, Fordham university. Um, did you, um, well, let me back up. When you um, went off to college, were you pursuing um, a musical or a music degree? Um, yeah, I mean, I wanted to be in the arts. I mean, I, I'm also an actor. Um, and so I wanted to be in the creative arts and whatever I felt like could be there, like could help me do that. And more importantly, I just wanted to be in New York. Like I wanted to be in New York. For me, it was like LA or New York and being from the Bay at that time, I was like LA now, ew. I don't like those people. I don't like that place. I've since changed, but you know, we've always had a rivalry. Well, not anymore. I think there's a lot more Bay LA love, but back in the nineties, um, there was like, it's a, just a different vibe. We're better. So I wasn't trying to be in LA um, and I wanted to be in New York. And then, yeah, I did get um, a musical education in school. And I think that was something that was important too, to kind of, um, I was gonna say verify, and that's not exactly the word I mean, but just to give some credibility to what I wanted to do, you know, um, and get some more background experience. Um, so that was an important part of it. And also the ability to intern. I, I can honestly say the most important part of my college education was the ability for me to have internships in different record companies and entertainment companies while I was in school. That was honestly the best education that I got because I really wanted to know what was happening behind the scenes before being in front of the camera. Like I wanted to know how things were working. And so I, from my freshman year, I pursued internships heavily and made sure every year I was at a different record company. Okay. Um, so you learned a lot about how the business works. Now, speaking of that, um, are you a independent artist? Or are you signed to a label or how does that work? Yeah, I'm an independent artist. Uh, the jazz album that I have, I released 
with the indie label, but now I've been releasing music on my own. So how that works is that you do a lot of everything <laughs> and you have to make a lot of decisions on your own and put up a lot of your own money. And I'm still, this is my first time kind of doing this on my own, like just since I've been releasing music since December. So it's been a learning process. Um, you know, like I know the things that go into it, but do I have the capacity as one person uh, to do all the things that are required? is not necessarily and plus the music industry has changed so much from when I was in college and when I was like in it to what is happening now and what the possibilities are now but yes I'm an independent artist okay is the is the goal to um, sign with the label or just to stay um, independent um is the goal to sign with? I don't know that it is. I mean, my goal is to be in a position to put out music regularly and to be able to make money for my music and continue to build my career. So if I'm able to gain support, like as in human resources people and like bring in um, kind of like investments or whatever from other people, that's still independent, right? And if I'm able to do that, that's good enough for me. If it happens that I have a label offer and that accomplishes that goal, then I would consider that as well. I'm not, I'm not one camp or the other. Like it's kind of whatever the situation is and whatever provides the support that I need to continue to, to grow and release music and create music. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I understand that. Um, now I mentioned earlier that you, you split your time between New York and Paris. What is it about Paris that that draws you to to? Um, I mean, it looks great on TV and in the movies, but I've never been there. But what is it about Paris? Um, well, there's a few things. First of all, there's a rich history of African Americans going to Paris and being musicians and and being um rewarded and treated respectfully in a time that they weren't here um in paris throughout all the, you know the world wars and all of that through josephine baker and miles davis and all these other people who did it so that was something that i knew about going there and just i also when i was in paris i started giving tours about the histories of history of african americans so i got more into that kind of legacy and i also benefited from it like going there and and being uh, african-american they people were just assumed that I was good. And so there was opportunities for me based on that positive assumption of the people who'd gone there before me that I didn't necessarily have when I was in New York, which was more so like show and prove, which nothing's wrong with that, but that's not exactly the most nourishing environment. Whereas Paris, there's that support, um, not only because I'm African-American, but also they support arts. Like they put their money like where their mouth is. So it's not just like, yeah, we like to benefit from it and capitalize on it. But there's a system there where um, kind of anyone in the artist field, um, if you do a certain amount of hours or a certain amount of shows, they understand it's basically like a gig economy. Like if you, if you work in music, you're going from gig to gig. You're not employed by anybody. Um, and so there's a system that if you have a certain amount of shows or you booked a certain amount of gigs, the times that you're not booking, they will pay you uh, like an average of what you made those other times. So that's a real way to say we actually understand how like the arts and a creative profession works. And we want to support that because we feel it's valued. So um, that's a really important part of it. And um, I've always been very results oriented. And I think you know, the American way is kind of like, what, like, what is the last thing you did? What is it? You know, it's very much about showing what you have to offer. And in Paris, I think they also, French culture um, understands things taking a little bit longer. And so they also respect the process of creation and discovery. And so it's not so much like, okay, well, what did you do? But it's like, okay, what are you doing? How are you exploring this? How are you developing in this way? And so for a creative, for myself being a creative person, it just felt comfortable to create and, and explore there um, without the pressure um, of performing. And I mean that in all senses. Um, so that's something that's great. And then it's a beautiful city. Like I have to be honest, I, I never really, I mean, before I'd gone there, I knew, I knew about it and, and things like that, but I wasn't someone, there's people who are like in love with Paris and have all this dreamy idea. And I wasn't one of those people, um, but it's a really beautiful city. And there's so many ways that you're taking care of 
as a human, <laughs> you know, with like health insurance and all these things that you could just enjoy life a little bit differently. And so I think for me, I mean, I can be, ex I can be uh, inspired by both negative and positive experiences, but positive and comfort inspire me more because it just gives me the freedom to allow my creative ideas to flow. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what's special about Paris to me. Okay. I know um, just um, I was watching a documentary maybe a year or so ago and I was, it was on James Baldwin and he was just raving about the, uh, what you're talking about, the artistic side of being in Paris and how they appreciate that. Uh, but I think he yeah. lived there for a while too. Um, we'll continue our episode after this message. Are you looking for a reliable way to transfer money to family and friends? Check out the Cash App. It's safe, easy, and convenient. Just download the app from the Apple or Google Play Store and start receiving and sending money in a few minutes. Sign up today and receive $5. And don't forget to use our referral code. BGRCWQX. Swag at shop.bringbacksoulmusic.com. Now, back to our conversation. Okay, so that's Paris. Now let's get into some of your music. Um, okay. Now, the song that really brought uh, you to my attention was Lately. Um, I love that. Like I so said, we did feature that on our new music section. Um, now, I read in your, in your, in your, um, in your profile that you plan on releasing music, I think I read like every month or every other month. Every month. Every I've, month. Yeah, since December, I've released a song a month. Um, with two, they're kind of two different projects, though. So uh, Lately and Feel Immortalized are parallel, and they're with the same producer, Paris Lamont. Um, and then I'm releasing the songs. So I've released two other songs from another project uh, that I work with different pr producers. So it's, again, just me um, experimenting and putting out the stuff that I've worked on. You know, like I've always... In the past, I've been pretty precious about like waiting till things are perfect. And now I'm like, listen, I did it. I think it's good. Let's just see what people feel about it. Like, what's the energy that comes back? And so lately wasn't initially the one that I thought I would put out first, but it just felt right for the time, the season, because I just felt like it. it's kind of cozy vibes. And I think it was just a good introduction to be back on the music scene after releasing this jazz project and being kind of off of it for a while. I just thought it was a nice, smooth introduction. Okay. Um, yeah, I love Lately when I first read it, or I first heard it, excuse me. Um, now, what did you like about it? I'm what sorry, what's that? Did, what did you like about it? I like the uh, jazz aspect of it, and you really, um, I, I hate to compare um, artists, but um, you kind of had like a Jill Scott feel to it, but um, yeah, it didn't yeah, I kind of felt like it was like Jill Scott or kind of maybe some Erica Badu mm -hmm. um, and I just love the way it it was kind of um, or it is kind of it's kind of a sexy song, you know, mm -hmm. like um, a relationship type song. Um, and that's what I kind of liked about it. It was very smooth and, um, and you can definitely hear the jazz influence in it. And I'm not sure, I, I'm sure that was on, intentional, but um, so that's what I really liked about it. Um, and so I was going to ask you before we were talking about growing up in the Bay Area and you said back then you were listening to, you know, Too Short and <laughs> The Loonies. Was there any other R and B or soul singers that um, I know? In Vogue was out at that time, and Tony was, Tony, they're from the Bay. Um, fan, huge Tony Braxton fan. Like Tony Braxton was like the big. So I saw Patti LaBelle at the Paramount Theater. So uh, okay. before I revitalized, obviously, and then Tony Braxton. I I don't remember the name of the venue, but it was the first time I. It was her and Kenny G in concert. It must have been, was it San Jose? I don't think it was that far. I don't remember what the big, but it was the biggest concert I'd seen. So these were in Vogue, I was a huge, huge fan of. And Tony Braxton at the time, those are two people. Uh, and then Mariah Carey, who's like, it's pop. But uh, those are people that I really listen to a lot, like all the time. 
Um, so I listened to a lot of music. I was just saying the Bay music that I listened to was. Right, right, right. But I've always had a very eclectic musical taste. Um, and like I said, I've been exposed to a lot. So I saw a lot of Nancy Wilson too, was one of the concerts that I saw like at Kimball's East or at, um, what's the venue that I still go to uh, in Oakland? The other jazz venue, I'm forgetting the name right now. There's yeah, one- I know you're talking about. Um, oh my God, how do I not remember? Wilson? Um, it will come to me, but yeah, so there, so yeah, I would say in Vogue, Tony Braxton, um, I loved SWV, Escape, like I remember one Christmas I got everybody's CD and I was like in heaven, those were, that was the moment of the girl bands and so I listened to all of them and I, I always tell people that I really like vocals and I don't feel like we hear that many people sing anymore. You know, like it's, a, there's a lot of production and things like that, but I think because I grew up on those singers, it was like, I was just hearing those voices, hearing those runs, hearing how they were holding notes and sustaining things. And that got me really excited. Okay. Did you, um, did you grow up singing in the church too or, or no? I didn't, I didn't come from a church background. Um, so I started singing like in, with other people at at school, um, in the choir, I was a part of the Oakland youth chorus, uh, growing up. And I was with this traveling group. Um, I think there was like four of us run by this woman by, um, Anita Watkins, I think her name was. And we would go around the Bay area and perform a range of different, like kind of spirituals done in a different way, gospel numbers, a bit of everything. So um, that was a part of my background. Okay. Um, let's back up a little bit now. Um, this is a new, you said that you had been away or on hiatus for a while, I guess, but in 2016, you also released an EP called lost myself. Yeah. It's a jazz album. Okay. Was that your first, um, EP or album? It was, it was my very first dip into the music industry and my very first project. And yeah, it's a collaboration with Florian Poussier and we did it all in Paris. And um, yeah, that was my first, that was my first thing. Okay. What was the, um, what was it like putting together your first, uh, your first EP? Did you do a lot of writing or all the writing on that, um, on that album? I did because I was working with French artists, many of whom did not speak uh, English. So I was saying to somebody recently too, how interesting that is because there was a way that I couldn't get feedback in the way that I can now because it was, they were like, great, whatever. We don't really know what you're saying. <laughs> um, so it was a long process. We, you know, we created together, like in the same room, like I, I can come up with melodies pretty easily. So I'd have a melody and then he would play to it and we, you know, uh, improvise until we found something good or there were times that I would come in with ideas and be like okay this is how I want it to sound can you make it sound like that um so yeah it was a good process I mean there was a lot of of, I'm trying to figure out the words to describe it just there was a lot of ways I had to lean on myself you know like there wasn't a lot of feedback like I said um and it was my first time doing it and my first time like really being in collaboration with somebody. So I really just had to be present and say, okay, like I'm gonna just give it my best shot. I don't even know what kind of, cause I wouldn't say that I was like, I wanna be a jazz singer. That was never the plan. They approached me, the, the piano player that I was working with, he's um, a jazz pianist. And so they're like, we think we can create something great with the two of you. And so I was like, okay, okay. And just finding ways to put my different elements in there too. Like there's two songs. I mean, the the album is really kind of, it's very diverse. Like there's a Fela Kuti cover. So that's Afrobeat. There's like Feeling Good from Nina Simone, but done like in a Bossa Nova style. And then there's two tracks that have a reggae feel to it. So I really tried to bring in this world view that I have um, with the consistency of my voice kind of being sultry and and jazzy um, and the melodies bringing in these different like uh, the, pro- not the production, but the, the, mu- the instrumentation having like bebop and a little bit of hip hop because the, the pianist, he had gone to the new school in New York. So he had that background. So yeah, um, I mean, all of it is an experiment. I always say, it's just like, it's all an experiment. And so that's what it was. We just, I just put my best foot forward 
um, asserted myself in every way that I felt like I could and tried to put out something that I felt proud of. Okay. Now that was in 2016. Um, why the, um, why so much time between uh, Lost Myself and the uh, string of music that you're releasing now? Because I'd lost myself. <laughs> so I had to find myself, you know, it was, I was really, I was touring. Uh, I've been touring up until, two, you know, last year when everything kind of shut down, but I was touring a lot and I was experimenting with new songs. So there are a lot of new songs that when I'm on the road, I perform all the time, but that have had not been recorded and still have not been recorded. So it was more, like I said, experimenting with things and just trying to figure out where I wanted it to go. Um, and so I just been working with different people, doing a lot of traveling for touring and figuring it out. And, and, uh, I guess at the end of 2019, I was like, okay, listen, you can explore your whole life. I need to put something out. Let me figure out like what I like, what direction and put something out and it will be what it is. Like the artist's journey is a journey. It's not supposed to be like, and here is everything I figured out. And now I know it like it's. It's a process and it's okay if it evolves and changes. So it was just me deciding to finally, like enough time has passed. You need to, you've been exploring and you're going to continue to explore your whole life. Put something out. Okay. Uh, I think I read in your, uh, your profile that um, you toured or open uh, or toured like 15 different countries at some point. So yeah. was that between the, the 2016 and the 2019 that you were, yeah, it started in 2015. I actually, um, one of the other ways that I share my music is I work as a U.S. music ambassador. So the, the U.S. embassy, um, like, presents me to different countries. Right now, it's mostly it's been in Africa. Um, and so I will go to different countries, like if the, the country wants me to come and perform for whatever reason, because they like my music, I will perform and I also give um, like master classes on music business or being an independent artist or a variety of things, whatever I feel like I want to teach at that moment. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think I've toured like 10 countries in Africa. I've done a few tours in Russia and Kazakhstan and like Belarus and different parts of Europe and Jamaica. Of course, I've performed in many times in the U.S. Um, so yeah, I've, I've gotten around. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it. Uh, well, congratulations on uh, all your success. Um, so um, going forward, um, well, hopefully we're on our way to being back to normal, whatever normal is going to be the new normal. Yeah. Um, has that hampered um, some of the release of music or your some of your some of your goals for 2020, even though we're in 2021? Or did you get backed up at all? Or did it have an effect on you one way or another? Yeah, it's interesting because I, I had it planned for 2020 to be the year of like creation and releasing music. So not as much touring. I was kind of like, I want to kind of shut it down so I can really focus. So it kind of worked out for me. Um, maybe the momentum that I might have had from like being able to be in people's space as I'm releasing the music has dampened, you know, because there's, there's not that just ability. Even though there's people who are listening, there's so many things online and so many ways to um, grab attention, I think I could have benefited from more, um, yeah, just more in FaceTime promoting the music that I'm putting now. But I did intend for last year to be a year where I was creating and thinking about how I wanted to release music. So that didn't stop me in this way. This year, we'll see what happens because apparently touring is not really supposed to come back till 2022. But maybe by then my music will have picked up some steam and people will be like, Shola, Shola. You know, I don't know. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's been, a, I mean, it's been a very, this is a very different year that I've had in the last six years. Because for the last six years I've been on the road and, and 2020, I, I didn't go anywhere. Like, okay. I didn't even really work. <laughs> wow. Okay. And um, mm, I got another question for you, but it sort of kind of ties in the, COVID. Um, Go for it. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of, you've already kind of answered that one. Um, okay, so 2021, fingers crossed, 
Um, we'll get back to some normalcy, I guess. Are you, um, and you see the, the uh, Instagram and the Facebook lives. Are you a part of that? Are you doing that to kind of keep yourself out there? And I haven't, I mean, I did, I did one like Facebook live in the summer. Um, and that was interesting, but it's also a transition for me because I've always played with a live band. Oh. And so none of my musicians are near me. Um, I, the musicians I've worked with have been in Jamaica or in Paris. And so it's like me playing with backing tracks, which is not that, not, it's not the same experience and not that interesting. So I kind of shied away from it. Like I've done some virtual shows, um, that people have asked me to do and I'm like making it work, but the experience for me is not as exciting just because it's like, it's just me singing to a track. Um, you know, so I, I, if someone asks me, I'll figure it out, but it's, it has, it's not my favorite way to perform or to stay active. I just don't find it as engaging. I see. I understand. Now I know here in the, uh, in the U S it's, well, I guess now a lot of places are starting to open back up. Um, is it the same over in Paris as well that, you know, uh, performing in clubs or outdoors is prohibited? for the time being, is it the same way over there that is this here? Yeah, I would say it's worse. Uh, worse. Unlike the US, both France and Jamaica, if I'll say those are two places that I'm close to, they've had uh, curfews this whole time and we've never had a curfew in the US. Like France has a curfew till 6 p.m., which means they're not allowed to go out of the house after six. Jamaica, their curfew has gone up and down. So I think up until last month, it was still 10 p.m. and now it's 7 p.m., which <laughs> if anyone knows anything about Jamaica, that's pretty crazy because Jamaicans party all night. And I like, I, this is the first year I didn't go to Jamaica and I normally go there for two and a half months. Um, because I'm like, if I have to be home by seven, I'm missing all the part that makes it what's inspiring to me, you know, which is the music scene, which is starts at midnight, you know? So yeah. Um, America in the U S we have way more liberties than these other countries do. Um, France is still on lockdown. They still don't have concerts or anything like that. And, Europe in general is a big, a lot of American artists survive on European touring because there's just such a bet. There's so much more support for it. So yeah, it's, it's a big deal, but it's, it, it is shut down. Okay. Um, what do you, um, what do you hope people get out of your music? Um, It, I think it's changed over time. Like my first project, I wanted people to just feel good and, you know, be joyous. Now it's more so about sharing myself and hopefully people can relate, you know, as I'm learning to be more, um, more transparent about what's going on in my world and in my heart and in my head. I think that rawness, which I'm still working on being more open that way. I think there's a lot of points of connection. Like I, I, I'm all about connection. And so I want people to feel like they can be connected to me or the music can connect them with other people. I think that's one of the biggest powers of music is connection, whether we're dancing. So the music is connecting bodies or we're connecting because we all feel the same way. Or um, some of the music that I've been releasing with the other project has been more politically charged so you can connect to maybe the emotions of what's going on and how you're feeling about it. So I just want people to feel connected and feel seen like they're not alone. Um, and that they're, you know, yeah, that they're, they're visible and, and they're connected to a greater experience. Okay. Let me follow up on, a, on one thing, Shola, that uh, we talked about earlier when we were talking about, lately and uh, feel immortalized. Now you said that those two were connected. Uh, how so? Is that part of a message that, um, that you're trying to relay to the listener? Um, does one song sort of piggyback off the other or what's the overall? Well, they're connected in a very technical way. They were made at the same time and by the same producer. So the, uh, January of 2020, um, I had an artist residency in my mom's home in Jamaica with a producer and we created 
three songs. And so another one is coming out uh, next month. Um, so there, those three songs are, so Lately and Feel Immortalized and the other one that's coming out next month called Think About Us. Those are all technically related because they're the same production and the same time. Lately and Feel Immortalized now, much later, I'm like, yeah, subject wise, they're pretty similar um, with me. Uh, mm -hmm. With me, I guess, really trying to understand how I feel about um, maybe being on the edge of certain relationships and m like at the point of ready to jump into being committed to something or someone. Um, so lately it's kind of like talking about this experience of getting to know somebody and being excited about this person and also maybe for the first time also realizing that you are excited, like letting yourself feel that excitement that this person bring, you know, brings up. And at the end of the song is kind of like, like it's kind of like an omission of like, not an omission, but a, um, well, maybe that is the word. It's it's more like I'm, I'm sharing with you that I'm feeling you, you know, and I'm really into it. And then feel immortalized is kind of like this dance between lovers who, you know, you're dealing with the world outside of you and you find a sense of, home and a, a feeling of being immortal when you're with this person. Um, and at the same time, you guys have not solidified that connection, even though you both feel it. So I think both of these songs are kind of in a dance of someone who, I mean, I'm the writer, uh, someone who is on the precipice of getting ready to jump and commit, like being able to feel the feelings, articulate them, say them, and, you know, make a move with them okay yeah. i get in i think um shola tell people where they can uh, purchase your music and also where they can connect with you uh, on social media okay well i have a new website sholamusic.com so s-h-o-l-a music.com and uh, from there you can see where all my music is it's on all the streaming platforms so any platform you have it's on there um, right now, Lost Myself, the, the vocal jazz album is available on vinyl or CD, and you can get those um, from me. I think I can sign some copies if someone sends me a message about it, but you can also get them wherever music is sold, like, you know, Amazon or even Bandcamp and things like that. And um, on Facebook and Instagram, it's Shola Adisa Farrar, which is also the name that you would find um, the music is released under Shola Adisa Farrar, but sholamusic.com. You'll find all the links to everything that can be the hub uh, for where to reach out. And like I said, I'm active on Instagram and Facebook. So you could definitely shoot me a message. I respond to all of them. And I like to hear from people and like what they think about the music and definitely give it some spins on whatever streaming platform you listen to. Okay. We'll have uh, Shola's, all Shola's information on our website too at bringbacksoulmusic.com. And if you're watching this on YouTube, there'll be it in the description. Um, Ms. Shola, um, anything else you want to add while we're talking? And at the time I'm in California, you're in New York, so um, I don't want to keep you too late. But anything else you want to add before we, uh, this has been a great conversation, by the way. Yeah, nothing I want to add, but I have a question for you again. Yes, yes. So this soul music which means you're a love of soul music so would you consider now nowadays music is so genre bending right like there's so many things that it's not so clear and people say you know like r&b doesn't exist or soul doesn't exist anymore what do you have to say about that and what genre would you put lately or feel immortalized in um well i would put it in the soul category but I would also put it in the jazz category. Really? Yeah, I'll put it in the jazz category. Okay. Um, and, you know, soul and jazz are so closely related anyway. But, yeah, I would put it in those two categories. In terms of your first question, I do believe that um, um, music is so segmented now. Um, and it's it's hard to, um, I guess, for R&B and soul artists, it's hard to 
um, get a lot of attention um, because it's, you know, pop and uh, hip hop and those seem to dominate the airways. Mm -hmm. So for um, R&B artists, it's, it's kind of tough. There's some art there, but certainly not like it was in the past. Mm -hmm. And um, and there's no more bands anymore. And so um, it's kind of, to me, unfortunate, but that's why we started Bring Back Soul Music. Maybe it's like um, a shot in the dark or pie in the sky or whatever adjective you want to use. But um, there has to be, and speaking of that, but speaking of that, when we started, we interviewed a lot of American artists and you were speaking earlier about Paris mm -hmm. and to a T, all of them said, you'll be surprised how big R&B soul music is overseas. Yeah. And I didn't, I couldn't relate because I hadn't been there. But when I talk to you and talk to other artists, it just sort of reaffirms what I heard earlier when we first started the podcast. Because like you said, a lot of artists will go over to England and Paris and um, tour and do club dates and they earn a living. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't know that existed until I started interviewing artists from here who say they go over to Europe. Yeah. Um, so I hope, my hope is that it does come back um, and it, it probably won't come back to the way it was in the eighties and the nineties and the seventies. Um, oh. At least kind of get close to that. You know what I mean? And there's some great artists out there like yourself and others who we've interviewed. And, and I thought, man, had it not been for this podcast, I would have never probably found out about all the good music that I get sent. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so that's the unfortunate part because everybody can't make it, you know yeah. what I mean? And there's only so much attention that it's out there. And it seems to be right now that the emphasis is not on R&B. So um, that's why I'm trying to do my part. All right. Well, we appreciate you. I hope that answers your question. It does answer my question. Okay. We appreciate you doing your part. All yeah. of it matters. You know? Yeah, it takes a village. I heard one time before. So, you know, if you keep putting out good music, I tend to believe that if you put out good music, people will find it. Mm -hmm. But sometimes people need help finding it. So a lot of times um, they need help. Yeah. And, and so that's why I like to interview you, but, artists yeah. like yourself. So you keep doing what you're doing and hopefully this will catch on and more people do podcasts and and stuff like this to bring attention to um in my opinion, the the best genre of music out there. And I'm a little biased, but <laughs> I think R&B and soul music is, you know, the best kind of music. Um, yes. So there you go. Got it. Thank you. That was a great answer to my question. Right. <laughs> Anything else I can help? Wait, wait a minute. Huh, I'm interviewing you. You ain't supposed to be interviewing me. James, I was curious <laughs> about this platform. Oh, I understand. I understand. <laughs> um, so anything else you want to you wanna share with us? Um, you are releasing new music, uh, you said next month. Follow me on if you're streaming music, do that. Um, I love feedback, so if people want to say what they feel, I'm always open to that. Um, and yeah, come on the journey with me because it is definitely a journey. I'm a woman out here living in the world, traveling around the world, and picking up things and information and inspiration as I go. So, my music should be a reflection of that. Yeah. One quick question for you, for you, and I'll let you go. Um, because of your extensive travel uh, and your background, um, I think you said you normally spend two and a half months in Jamaica. Do you do like island music or Jamaican music? Is that something that's coming or is that something you want to do? Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned that your parents took you to all kind of jazz and um, concerts when you were younger. So where are you going? And I hate to label people, but where are you going musically? Are you trying to just broaden um, the scope of music that you do? I mean, what, what can people expect from me? From, you know, yeah. That's what I was just trying to answer, I think, uh, which is like, it could be all kinds of things. 
Um, so like I said, my last project has some, some reggae to it. And one of my most popular songs is Blue Chords, which just has like a, a simple kind of reggae beat, but it's the most popular, at least on streaming platforms. Um, uh, so it's really like, if you like the quality of my voice, then you will probably like whatever I put out. Cause I don't think it's gonna be anything crazy. Um, I've been trying to find a way to bring it all together. And it might just make more sense that I do project by project, you know, like that was a jazz project. Now I'll do a reggae project. Now I'll do this to make it make sense. But it's like, I grew up singing all of it, ex being exposed to all of it. So it's just finding, I'm just looking, my ultimate artistic goal is to find what fits my voice the best, you know, and what I feel most at home performing or singing, what feels like, ooh, that feels like me, like this fits. Um, and I don't know if I found that yet. And so it's always that. It's New York for you. <laughs> we'll pretend that didn't, didn't happen, go ahead. Yeah, so um, for me, the, the, my, my biggest, the biggest part of finding the music is finding the voice, like finding what fits my voice best and where I feel most at home in, in the music that I perform and sing and create. So that's a journey. So I don't know what to tell you to expect. Just expect more music, more of these vocals, um, and to go on a journey with me. If you haven't been to Paris, maybe you can go through Paris, go to Paris through my music. Okay. You know. Sounds good. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Wow. That's Shola. And you can find out more about Shola on her website at sholamusic.com. Shola, I really appreciate you taking the time today. I'm glad after two months, two months. Of trading emails back and forth, we got a chance to talk. And I was pleasantly surprised to know that you're from the Bay Area as well. No, that's a great surprise. Yep. Oakland born and bred. I hear you. All right. That's Shola on the Bring Back Soul Music podcast. And we'll be right back. Calling all lovers of soul music. The time to make soul music relevant again is now. You've been listening to the Bring Back Soul Music podcast with Todd Woodson. If you enjoyed today's show, be sure to tell a friend. Make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing to our newsletter at bringbacksoulmusic.com. That's our show for today. I'd like to thank my special guest, Shola. You can find out more about Shola on her website at sholamusic.com. Don't forget, you can listen to the Bring Back Soul Music Podcast on iTunes, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and Pandora. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel at Bring Back Soul Music TV. If you have any questions or comments, please email us at comments at bringbacksoulmusic.com. Don't forget to check out all our latest merch at The Soul Shop at shop.bringbacksoulmusic.com. I'm Todd Woodson. Thank you for joining us. See you next week.